Uh, we're very pleased this morning to have Dr. Titley, a nationally known expert in the field of climate, uh, here with us this morning. And he has uh, served as a naval officer for 32 years and rose to the rank of Rear Admiral. Dr. Titley's career included duties as Commander, Naval Meteorology and Oceanography <laughs> Command, Oceanographer and Navigator of the Navy. Uh, as a sailor, I know how important the weather is once you're out there. With all those planes and ships, uh, a pretty darn important thing to, uh, to know a lot about uh, when you're running a Navy. While serving the Pentagon, Dr. Titley initiated and led the U.S. Navy Task Force on Climate Change. After retiring from the Navy, Dr. Titley served as Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Operations, the Chief Operating Officer position at the National Oceanic and, Administrative and Atmospheric Administration. That's a tongue twister for me. He has spoken across the country and throughout the world on the importance of climate change as it relates to national security. The Department of Defense requested his he present on their behalf at both the congressional hearings and the intergovernmental panel on climate change meetings from 2009 to 2011. He's currently the professor of practice in the Department of Meteorology at Pennsylvania State University. The founding director of Penn State Center for Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk. The center will help develop organizations and citizens. Oh, I'm sorry. The center will help organizations and citizens prosper to succeed in today's and tomorrow's weather and climate environment. I'll let him go yeah, there. It's, I'm, it's all good. This is a holy smokes. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. It's, it's way too much. All right, thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Dan and, uh, and Rick, uh, Sarah, Mayor Hartwell. Uh, thanks so much for, for having me uh, here today. This is, this is actually really good. And actually, after listening to the mayor's uh, kind of comments, it's like, well, you know, I should just shut up and sit down right now. I mean, he's kind of covered a whole bunch of what, uh, what I was going to say, what I was going to say anyway. So, uh, but I'll, I'll try to go through a couple things. So, uh, obviously, the logo on the left, everybody's familiar with. Uh, this, this thing called SCRIM, Rock Ethics was already mentioned. Rock Ethics actually uh, it is part of this, this uh, team we have. Uh, headed at, at Penn State called the Sustainability Climate Risk uh, Management Initiative. And it's funded by the National Science Foundation. And we got a lot of people participating in it. Amongst others is uh, Rock Ethics. So I want to want to thank, uh, thank, thank Scrim there for, for helping us out. So I'm going to go, just go through uh, this morning a little bit about kind of how the military sort of thinks about climate change, how we're dealing, I shouldn't say, I, I'm gonna keep lapsing into this we, it's no longer we anymore, but after you've been there for 32 years, it's hard to get rid of that. Uh, so how the US military is kind of dealing with climate change, uh, I, I hope it can kind of come across as a pragmatic, nonpartisan, just the facts kind of thing, because that's how we, how we look at it. And, I'll wrap up with you know, what I think may be some components that, that translate into, into other sectors, such as state, local, regional, uh, city, city type government, governments. So just uh, one slight background on, uh, on who I am. As, as was mentioned, uh, I'm now up at Penn State, and you know, it's, it's really cool, and I actually spent my undergraduate time there. I would love to tell you that when I was an undergrad, it looked like that, but it didn't. It looked much more like that. Uh, and that's not me, but it could have been me. I was one of those weather weenies, and I had, if you had told me I was gonna be up here talking about climate 30 some odd years later, I, I would have wondered, what are you talking about? I was just gonna go do weather, and just go do forecasting, and I was gonna be very, very happy at that. Uh, as was mentioned, I, I ended up in the Navy. Uh, I'd love to tell you it's because, you know, my great-great-great-grandfather was John Paul Jones, but that's not true. Nobody in my family was in the Navy. Uh, I ended up in the Navy because they paid for college, and I needed somebody to pay for college. So, you know, hey, whatever. It was Reserve Officer Training Corps, you know, and the deal was uh, they would pay 
for college, and I would give them four years. And since I'm such a great guy, I was on what I called the four year and one day plan. I was gonna give them one extra day. Uh, but a funny thing kind of happened. It turned out I kind of liked it. And I was, uh, the Navy thought I was at least minimally competent at doing what they asked me to do. So four years and a day turns into the, well, as long as I kind of like it and they don't throw me out. And, and those two conditions were met for 32 years. So that worked, that worked out okay. So, you know, and that's, you know, it, it just, you never know how life, how life turns out. And my guess is every one of you could tell kind of a story like that. Okay, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about climate change, but I would ask you, and, and this is like super easy with an audience like this of thinking from business and government and nonprofits, it, because you guys do this every day anyways. You know, this is not all about climate. And in sometimes, in fact, in a lot of times, you know, climate's just one of, and it's maybe not even the most important things, but it's one of the components that needs to be considered whenever you're thinking about the future and thinking about future investments and policies and stuff like that. Uh, again, that's sort of preaching to the choir here, but when I go talk to all my climate friends and climate scientists, they, you know, you gotta sometimes remember them, remind them there's a world sort of beyond, beyond their discipline there. So, you know, one of the things that kind of drives the, the world is uh, the demographics, you know? So we're up pushing eight billion people, seven and a half billion people right now. So as the climate changes, we're dealing with this with more and more people um, on the planet. Uh, all of those people uh, expect, and I would argue, and maybe Rock Ethics can comment on this here later on in the day, I would argue have a right to at least some degree of food, energy, water you know, some quality of life, because it's really, really tough to have any kind of quality of life if you don't have energy, if you don't have assured water, clean water, and food, in many ways, is just water by another name. It's really hard to grow food without water. So we have this resources competition. You know, I mean, you know, I'm sure in Western Michigan, you know, the world is becoming globalized. I grew up in upstate New York, and we've seen kind of the same trends in manufacturing and, and, and changes in jobs and economies, but whether we like it or not, it's just sort of a fact of the world, is, is the world's globalized. What does that mean for climate? It means that, you know, if you have flooding in Thailand, you know, that potentially can impact your supply chains. Uh, it's not like just, yeah, that's it's too bad for those guys 17 time zones away from us. It can, it can impact our jobs and our economy right here. And then as we all know, you know, I think my phone is a second to left right there. Uh, actually, it isn't. I have the oldest iPhone in the world. It's still an iPhone 3. It has vacuum tubes in it, but that's another story. Uh, technology keeps marching on, and that does a whole lot of things, but one of the things it does is it actually kind of drives transparency. So not only do we have these 7 billion people, resource constraints, globalization, you know, but what you are or are not doing with respect to how you manage and treat the world will become known, is becoming known. You know, if you don't believe that, ask the National Security Administration. They, they got a lot of stuff that's known yet. Uh, and finally, who are these fine people? I thought this was a climate talk where they look like a bunch of politicians. You know, it's the G20 summit because at least what we tell ourselves in the Western world is that we're out of money, right? We tell ourselves we're fiscally constrained, you know, sequestration is still on the books. You know, does it come back next year? I don't know. But, you know, we tell ourselves we're out of money. So we're going to deal with these demographics, climate, resources, all that stuff. And we're going to do it probably in a fiscally constrained or not a whole lot of money kind of environment. Okay, who's read the, uh, the entire IPCC reports? I mean, they're only about 3,500 pages. <laughs> Okay, maybe not everybody's read that. The, the Svelte National Climate Assessment that came in at about 1,050 pages. Okay, I haven't done it. Uh, so I have one slot on, because I can only remember three bullets, so it's three bullets, and it's sort of like, why should we care about climate? And in simplest terms, I look at it is it's people, it's water, and it's change. And I'll just try to go through those in very, very quickly. What do I mean by people? Uh, if you do a Google search, just type in climate change, and don't actually look at the links and stuff, but then click on images in Google, and I did this because I have no life at home. Uh, count them all up. See what you get in there. When I did this, almost a third of them 
or like polar bear, or polar bear related kind of pictures. You know, and if you do that, you could easily come away thinking, hey, this climate change thing, it's all about like some kind of faraway species of bear that eats people if they get half a chance. Why would I, you know, really care about that? And, and I would argue it's not about the polar bears or even the polar bear plunges. It's really about us. It's about you and me and our families and our neighbors and our communities and our towns. That's who's getting impacted by climate change. It's like, yeah, it does impact the polar bears as well, and, and I feel sorry for them, but do you really think we're gonna potentially look at changing the world's energy system for polar bears? Really? I mean, no, we're not. I really don't think we will. But if it's for us, then we may start thinking about that. So it's people, not polar bears. If there's one unifying thing or sort of integrating sort of theory about this, and you could argue, you could find some others, I think. But I kind of look at water. I look at where the water is, where the water isn't. Too much, too little, wrong place, wrong time. Uh, salty, where it used to be fresh. Liquid, where it used to be frozen. Changes in chemistry. You know, across the world, we're seeing either droughts are getting drier, when it floods, it seems to be coming up more than it ever had, you know, and then you bang, you go back to the other extreme. So this whole idea of, you know, the water tends to drive, drive an awful lot. And I think uh, Grand Rapids has had some experience with some recent pretty significant flooding just in the last, what, 18 months or something like that. Almost every place has. I mean, Baltimore, just this summer, you know, six inches of rain in six hours, it's crazy. And, and nothing can really with, withstand that, that sort of thing. And then finally, it's about change. I mean, and, you know, so we talk about climate change, and to me, the climate per se, you know, unless you live in San Diego, I mean, there's not a whole lot of places where the climate is being ideal. Uh, San Diego is pretty darn close to ideal. But I live in central Pennsylvania. It's not ideal there. I'm not sure that you would claim western Michigan is as nice a building as this is, but the climate may not be uh, ideal. But we've kind of known what it's going to be, right? We kind of know when the spring shows up, about how warm the summer is going to be, about what rains we get, about how much snow, etc., right? And then it all, and we've literally built our towns, we've built our agriculture, we've built our industries on that assumption, whether we ever explicitly said, you know, hey, this is an assumption. It just was. So we built everything to that, just like we built our cities at sea level, because that's where it was. And it stayed there for hundreds and thousands of years. And now all this stuff starts changing. So the real question is, is can we change as fast or faster than the climate changes? And if we do, it'll be a bumpy ride, but we'll kind of be okay. And if we don't, then, you know, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be pretty exciting. So let me just go through two slides on this whole change thing, and, and we'll get off this part. So here's, you know, half a million years, long, long time. So really old, back here on the far left, and the present is pretty much right up here on the, on the right. And it really doesn't matter what you look at. You can look at carbon dioxide in green. You can look at temperatures in red, sea level. And this is going up and down hundreds of feet, hundreds of feet, up and down, up and down. So, you know, how many people have heard, hey, what's this big deal? Climate's always changed, right? It's always changed. It's always going to change. Every, everybody's probably heard that. And they're right. It has on geologic timescales. But then when we sort of look at human timescales, you know, human time scales, you know, when did we get agriculture and pyramids and civilization? Eight, ten thousand years ago, right? Not all that long ago. And what have we had? This is just happens to be sea level, but notice how steady it is. It's sort of like the Goldilocks period. We've literally built human civilization based in part on that climate stability. And now if we sort of get rid of that, for whatever reason, if we sort of dump the climate stability, then we've got a real challenge. Except this time we're not going to do it with a few hundred thousand people, we're going to do it with nearly eight billion and all that stuff I showed before. So that's kind of the thing. So people, water, and change. And, and that's kind of how I think of this stuff. Is politics in there? No. Is beliefs? No. It's just people, water, and change. That's, that's really all I'm looking at. Okay.
Anyone know what this thing is? It's a sextant. Hey, some people know this. When I give this talk like to college kids, they have no clue. I mean, they absolutely have no clue. So one of my jobs, actually it was maybe one of my favorite jobs in the Navy, uh, back when I was, well, really young, uh, I got to be the navigator on a guided missile destroyer. And that was fun. And it was way before the days of GPS. And again, you know, the kids nowadays, they don't believe that you know, this thing would not allow you to navigate back 30 years ago because you didn't have this and you didn't have GPS. But that's okay. You know, so one of the things you learn as navigator is look at everything, but trust nothing 100%. But you look at everything, you use the stuff in between your ears to kind of integrate it, figure out where you are, where you're going. And if you can do that, that's good. If you can't do that, you'll probably be filling out an employment application for Walmart faster than you thought you would. So, so that's kind of you know, what I did. And then when 30 years later I was asked to look at climate, I kind of took the same thing. It's like, well, let's look at the data. Let's just see what's going on. Let's not trust any one thing totally. But what does sort of the balance of evidence tell us? So I'm not going to, I mean, you know, we could have a week-long thing on this. We're not going to do a week-long thing. We're going to do three slides. Uh, but I'll just go through three slides to, to kind of show some of the stuff that's going on. So if I can get this to run. There we go. So this is going to be temperatures from the late 19th century to, uh, to about a couple years ago. And I'll run it a couple times. This is just an animation. And if you can see down at the center uh, left, here's the year. So there's, you know, we're coming up on World War I, 1914 right there. Blues are colder than the long-term 20th century average. Reds are warmer. So here's the Dust Bowl. See how the U.S. got warm, but there's a lot of blues. World War II, 50s. Coming into the 60s. Who remembers the 60s? You weren't there if you did. Okay. 70s. 80s. 1990. 98. 2000. 2009. 2012. I'll run it just one more time. This is kind of cool. Okay, so starting again. 1890s. 1900s, you guys can see this. So just kind of as you look at this, there's no computers here, there's no projections, there's nobody guessing that, hey, this is what I think it's going to be. This is just what the data showed us. Now this happened to come out of NASA, but you know, if you look at the NOAA data, or the Japanese data, or the British data, or even some uh, private data done by some folks who formally didn't really think there was anything in these data sets, they all look about the same. So here's 1980, and you can just kind of see how the temperatures across the world have been changing. Now there's still blotches and patches, and they go up and down if you're in any one location, but overall, I think you can kind of see the trend. So here's another one, and this is a little weirder. This comes out of actually the National Climatic Assessment. Uh, this goes back to about 1910 or so, all the way on the left. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I think till 2011, if you will, on the right, it happens to be for the Northeast, but you can find this for like in the Midwest and, and other places. And what it's showing is like the most extreme rainfalls, if you will, how much of your rain are you getting in the most extreme rainfalls? And what you can see is, yeah, there's always a lot of variability, but over time, especially over the last 15, 20 years or so, it's not just what we're kind of thinking. It is, in fact, you know, the data are showing that when it rains, it tends to rain harder. And we're seeing this in the south, in the north, uh, somewhat in the, in the west, but especially like in our part of the country here, this, this is happening. So if you're starting to think, it's like, geez, the rivers are coming up closer to that 100-year mark. You know, it's like, why is it doing it time and again? Well, this is kind of driving that, because when you dump all that rain on a watershed really fast, guess, guess what's happened? Okay, here's one that, although it's not impacting uh, Grand Rapids, I think is just kind of interesting, because I had to call it recurrent flooding, 
because by the state laws in Virginia, you can't call this climate change. Got to love Virginia, right? Uh, I lived there for a long time. Uh, but they, but they were, but they were able to study recurrent flooding. And this is a neighborhood, the Hague is, it's not the Netherlands, this is a neighborhood in Norfolk, Virginia. And this is just the number of hours that it's underwater from salt water. And, you know, so just, just as Mayor Hartwell said, it's like, you know, the places that are dealing with this are the cities. Because, you know, if you're a resident of this, you know, you don't really care about the politics or why. You know, just like you kind of expect the city to take the trash out on Wednesday, you also expect them to, like, stop it, please, you know, do something. So, you know, I don't know what, but do something, because this is, this started, you know, this kind of sucks. So, so those are, you know, again, it's just some evidence of, of what's going on. And again, you know, I'm happy to talk about any of this. I mean, there's, again, you can go through the national climate assessments, the IPCC stuff. There's literally, you know, documents this thick of evidence. These are just three slides. I'm going to show you one model just to kind of show you in general how the climate models do. So, you know, I can't show you what the forecast, you know, how it's going to verify for 2050, 2060. If I could, I wouldn't be standing here right now because I'd be, I'd be really rich. But I can't do that. But what we can do is actually go back like 35 years, 30, 35 years, back to 1980, a guy named Jim Hansen, not the Muppets guy, the, the climate guy, uh, published in Nature magazine, which is a pretty good science magazine, uh, basically his computer model, which is the block line of where the temperature is going to go. And then what we've got is these thin red lines are the actual numbers, and then that purple line is like a five-year smoothed average. So was he right? No, he actually wasn't right. He was too cold. He was too conservative. Uh, so there's, there's kind of a saying in the weather community, and I think in the climate community as well, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I would argue that, yeah, technically this was wrong. He wasn't perfect, and almost none of these things are. But it did kind of show, and remember, this was from 35 years ago. Hey, you know, we'd kind of been flat, and now we're going to get on the escalator, and we're going to start going up on these global temperatures. So, you know, when people say, you know, we've got the big stuff figured out, we kind of do. And there's a reason for that, and, and this is it. So I've sometimes been asked, you know, do I believe in climate change? Anybody here believe in climate change? Yeah, you can tell there's a trick question here, can't you? Yeah, I don't. I don't believe in climate change. I'm convinced by the evidence, and I think we understand the reasons for, for the climate change. But to me, belief is something you do, you know, Friday night or Saturday night or Sunday morning or, you know, whatever. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's just really the, maybe I go to the Church of the Radiative Transfer Equation. That's, that's all that we have up here. And not only do we have that, but it's a bunch of old dead white guys that figured this stuff out. Uh, you know, Fourier, Tyndall, Arnhus, so you had a, a French, a Scot, a Swede, sounds like they walk into a bar, I don't know. But, uh, you know, Fourier basically figured out, hey, these gases in the atmosphere change the temperature. So he was like middle of the 19th century. And by the time you got to this guy here, Arnhus, a Swede, he said, you know, hey, this industrial revolution thing, we're putting a lot of CO2 into the air. He did some of the first global warming calculations. Turns out he was really low because he had no clue as to just how much CO2 we could actually put into the air. But he basically had the thing kind of right. So, you know, this is, I tell people, I, I love to tell the House Science Committee, there's an oxymoron. Uh, I love to tell the House, I shouldn't say that. Uh, I love to tell the House Science Committee, you know, this is cutting edge 19th century science. <laughs> it really is. I mean, so do we know everything? Do we know how Grand Rapids is going to be in the year 2037? No. But do we know the big pictures, the big forcing functions? Absolutely. So like, you know, if the glass is full, if you know every possible thing about climate at every scale and every time, and the glass is empty if you just know nothing, the glass is like three quarters to maybe a little more than that full. We know a lot. We know a lot. If the Intel guys knew as much as the climate guys, we'd go find General Clapper, who's the head of the Director of National Intelligence, stop whatever he was doing today, and get him down to the White House and give him a Medal of Freedom. 
I mean, if the, if the Intel guys could tell you with the same precision as what the climate guys could say about 30, 40, 50 years from now, that's what we would do. So we don't know everything, but we do know a lot. Okay, so a lot of times you guys hear about the whole attribution thing. You know, you get a big flood, you get a big storm, you get a big hurricane, and, and I mean, it's, it's like as predictable as a clock or whatever. You know, you, you get the media to say, you know, it was climate, it wasn't climate, it was. You know, it sort of sounds like a bunch of seven-year-old kids, right, on the schoolyard sort of arguing. Uh, I kind of think of it as a little bit different if you imagine that, you know, any one of these events, you know, that's weather. That's kind of like the cards you hold in your hand. Who's played poker? It's okay. You know, you, all right, some people admit, okay. You know what, I, I gave this talk in Utah, and I first had to say, let's all get on a bus, go to the Nevada state line, and then I could ask the question, and they got it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, imagine, let's say Sandy, for example, and if you're playing like a poker hand, five cards, let's say that's a full house, ace is high. Is it impossible to get? No. Is it unusual? Yeah, yeah, it sure is. So that's weather, the hand that you have. Climate's kind of a deck from which it came. You know, climate's sort of your possibilities from which it came. And I would argue that maybe our climate deck is starting to look, don't go to Vegas with this, by the way, is uh, starting to go look a little bit like this. I think we're starting to slip another ace or two into the deck. So now, full house ace is high. So, you know, if I go, I told you this is about how the military looks at this stuff. So this is a, a slide I love to show my military friends. This comes right out of one of the sort of the capstone documents of how you go and think about planning military operations. That's what it says, and it's in Joint Chiefs of Staff, purple and blue. It looks all very official. But if you kind of look at what's on this stuff, on the left-hand side, it's all planning. And on the right-hand side, it's like, okay, so now what are you going to do? And if you think about it, this is climate on the left, planning, you know, thinking about what that future is going to look like. This is weather on the right. You know, this is like, okay, it's rained four inches in three days and the river's coming up now, what am I going to do? You know, so it's no longer time for planning. You got what you got, but now what are you going to do? And that's really just what I call, I call it the business end of climate change. It's the changing weather. And that's kind of how the two are linked. And a lot of times you have climate people over here, weather people over here. It's like, dudes, you're actually all part of the same system here, whether you want to be or not. Okay, we're not going to go through this in any detail, but, but what I kind of do for the, for the military is on the left, it's like, you know, here are some things that are pretty important to you. What's going on in the Arctic? Your bases, because in, on a military base, that's actually where you generate troops, sailors, soldiers, airmen, marines that are ready to go and do whatever the president asks them to go and do. Disaster relief, if you got to do more and more of that, that becomes an issue. And then just some general security threats. You know, and you could pick another four, but that's what you have. And then, you know, how does it affect you? And these are sort of, again, I, I apologize for sort of the military words, but what I wanted to show you is, is when I look at this, when I sort of take the climate stuff into the military, I try to put it in terms that, it's like military terms. These are not like science geek climate terms. It's like, oh, okay. You know, I can show this to almost anybody in the Pentagon and they'll, their heads are gonna nod up and down. It's like, okay, yeah, I get it. So, you know, we can kind of go through, and I'll just go through this really quickly, but then you just start kind of filling in the matrix of where are the impacts. So the Arctic, you know, it's kind of everything. You know, it's a new mission for the surface ships. I used to say when I was in the Navy, this is the first time since, uh, Columbus, that we found a new ocean to work in here. It's been about 500 years, so, so this is kind of a, kind of a big deal. You know, and if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the Arctic, this happens to be the Bering Strait, so you've got Russia on the left and Alaska on the right. You know, here are the three things I think about the Arctic. It's a maritime environment. It's an ocean. You know, it's changing faster, actually, than any place in the world right now, and it's not a vacuum. It's not like Vegas. So what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing all the stuff with Ukraine and Crimea. We're seeing Russia changing how they work with us in the Arctic. And I would argue it's not for the better. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of very simply what's, what's going on. Now, just, just as a little aside, you see these two little islands in here, right in the middle of the Bering Strait? 
So you see there's one tiny one here and a little bit bigger one here. Do you know who owns the one on the right, the eastern one? It's the U.S. It's Little Diomede Island. And who owns the big one? Russia. Big Diomede Island. So, when you stand on the western side of Little Diomede on a clear day, you can see Russia from Alaska. <laughs> just wanted to let you know, if you remember nothing else, you can see Russia from Alaska. You just got to be in the right place. Okay, I'm going to show you this. This comes from my friends at NOAA, and I'll let this run a couple times. This is basically the ice from 1994 to 2012. Again, this is just satellite observations that they did some really cool things to put them together so you're not like getting, you know, uh, some sort of vertigo or whatever from watching a whole bunch of different satellites. They put them all on the same map. And then let me, let me go through, I'll, I'll let it run a couple times so you know what you're seeing here. So, okay, so we're going to go back to 1994. One of the cool things about this satellite uh, image, it's actually like uh, radar, is it can look through clouds, it can look through night. That's really good when you're in the Arctic. Uh, but it also tells you like where the really thick old hard ice is. And the way we've coded that up is that's the white. The bright white, the brighter the white, the harder, thicker, older the ice is. And the blues, they're the younger, thinner, softer ice. So watch what happens. You know, and this will be the third time through. So 97, 98, watch what happens when we get to 2007. So here's 2000, 01. You know, it's going around, and you can see, and the, and the ice really does this clockwise kind of gyre in here, and it moves like that, and you can see how it flows out down Greenland and creates icebergs, and it's a bad day for the Titanic. Uh, 07, it all falls apart. It tries to come back a little bit, sort of like my stock market portfolio tried to come back. And then in 12, it falls apart again. And that, ladies and gents, is more change than had I told anybody, let's say in the mid-90s, I didn't know this was going to happen, that it's like, hey, the ice is going to completely change in characteristic in 10 years or 15 years. People would have probably taken me out and given me a drug test. Because it's like, dude, that's just totally impossible. People would say, maybe, maybe it would happen by the middle to the end of the century. And it happened like that. You know, so that's when I say the Arctic is changing faster than any place in the world. That's what's going on. So it has big implications for resource extraction, mining, tourism, fishing, shipping, shipping lanes. So this came out of the uh, US Navy's uh, Arctic Roadmap that they published just earlier this year. And again, for orientation, the Bering Strait is right up at the north. Iceland right down at the south. You can see Greenland here sort of in the lower center. And you see this red line. That's, well, that's what's called the Northern Sea Route. It basically runs by the coast of Russia. And that's one of the first places the ice clears out. And everybody probably has heard of the Northwest Passage, right? We all learned about it in high school, the search for the Northwest Passage. That's right through all these islands in Canada. And I'll tell you, that's going to be like the last place the ice clears out. And also, it's got, for some technical reasons, like it's shallow in places, it's going to be kind of like Route 66, mythical. Everybody likes to talk about it, but how much traffic does the U.S. ship on Route 66 now? None, right? Or basically none. Interstate 40, that's another issue, but Route 66, not so much. The interesting one on this, I don't know if you can see it or not, is the green line. And the green line is basically an over-the-pole route. Deep water, shortest route, and when the ice clears out, uh, there's a lot of debate as to how much that's going to get used. But some pretty smart people putting a lot of money in are thinking that's going to get used. I'm going to keep going here just to keep going. Okay, I talked a little bit about bases. And that, you know, one of the things that comes up with is sea level rise. So a lot of times when we talk about sea level rise, we tend to think about Bangladesh, you know, and basically red is, red is bad, it's pretty low lying. Uh, or we think of the little Pacific Islands, and this was uh, in Copenhagen uh, a few years ago, in Tuvalu, one of the islands that's, that's most threatened. When I look at this from a security perspective, I think of this island here. This is uh, Diego Garcia, right in the middle of the Indian Ocean, uh, it's British-owned. The Brits let the U.S. military do just about anything we want, as long as we're nice to the turtles and the birds, and we are. Uh, and without this island, 
everything that the U.S. does in that part of the world, in the Middle East, in the Central uh, Asia, Southwest Asia, would be exponentially harder, including what we're doing today. So this is an amazingly strategic place, and it's about six or seven feet above sea level. So, yeah, we may want to think about that. It's a domestic issue as well. You know, we've got almost uh, four million people within about three feet of high tide. You know, so yeah, it's cold and snowy here, right, in March. March lasts forever in Grand Rapids. It does in Pennsylvania, I know that. You know, but hey, you're not down in Miami dealing with like water around your ankles just on a high tide like they're gonna have this weekend, and they do. Uh, the water's coming up about a foot in South Beach just because of the high tide. So I love the media, I watch the media, it's blamed on the moon. That's, that's why, it's like, okay guys. You, guys, you guys keep telling yourselves that. So, you know, but that's a, it's a real issue. Uh, I don't know, any financial people here? Okay, I always ask this question, how do I short the South Florida real estate market? I gotta figure that out, because this is, this is gonna be an issue down here. They're, they've got some real challenges. You know, but in addition to, to just the, uh, the sea level rise, you know, that water, that sea level coming up, if you're in a coastal area, it puts pressure on your saltwater aquifers, it puts pressures on your sewer systems, uh, it affects a whole lot more than just what we think of as a bunch of water coming into the first floor of your, uh, of your business or your, or your apartment there. There's, there's all this infrastructure. Uh, San Francisco's pretty, pretty concerned about this, as are, as are a lot of other places. You know, disaster relief, you know, that's another place that's, uh, that's coming up here. Uh, these are just some pictures from about a year ago, Super Typhoon High End. Uh, it really was an international uh, relief effort. Uh, the Japanese, the Filipinos, uh, these are U.S. Marine, uh, uh, sort of these vertical helicopters uh, that, uh, that are coming in. You know, it, it, it's a lot of stuff, but it takes up capacity. And how many more times are we going to do this? These data here came from Munich Re. And I've had a number of people say, well, okay, the reason you have more disasters is you have more people, and those people have more money, and they're living nearer the coast. It's not unreasonable, but if you look at this red, red is like earthquakes and volcanoes and uh, you know, tsunamis and stuff like that. And they don't really, this is like 30 years of data, they don't seem to be going up. So if it was just population and where they live and they're getting more money, why wouldn't the red go up as well? And all the other colors are, you know, there's they're some kind of weather or weather-related events. So they seem to be going up. And Munich Re, I don't know if anybody works in the insurance or reinsurance business here. You know, those guys don't really have a partisan view on climate, but they sure want to understand what their risk exposure is because they're betting the company if they get it wrong. So it's, it's pretty important for them to understand that stuff. And then just some security threats, I'll just go through very quickly here, is, you know, I got a picture of pretty fish, and the reason I've got that is, is the whole chemistry of the water is changing. You know, we put all the CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, it actually, about half of it, almost half of it gets absorbed by the, by the water, by the ocean water, but in turn, it makes some carbonic acid and it actually makes the ocean a little bit more acidic. You know, why should we possibly care? So, again, it sort of gets back to that change thing. And it's a real open question as to how the ecosystems are going to deal with it, how the critters are going to deal with it. You know, if they adapt, fine, hey, that's good. If they don't, then, you know, if the bottom parts of the food chain fall apart, then the top parts fall apart. And two billion, with a B, people on the world get their protein, primary protein source, from the ocean today. So if you start taken that back, then you put even more stress on the land, which is going to have its own challenges. So that's why we look at that. Look at, uh, you know, world food prices, and look at this big jump here around 2010, 2011. And it's not that the absolute amount went up all that high, uh, although it was, it was pretty high, but the rate of change was a big, big deal. And then when you combine that with existing grievances, I would argue not so great governance in, in a bunch of uh, North African states. Uh, North Africa is like the world's biggest importer of wheat. And the prices went up because in Australia, in Russia, and in Pakistan, there had actually been pretty big droughts. So three places, three big wheat growing regions, simultaneously, big drought, 
So supply goes down, price goes up, and you know, if the price goes up in the US, it's probably like throwing a match onto a bunch of diesel. What happens when you throw a match onto diesel fuel? It goes out. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what happens. Uh, throw a match into a bunch of gasoline vapors, you know, you get a different, different thing. And I would argue that, you know, the climate change is kind of like how many matches are we gonna throw into an existing place? So I don't know of anybody who says climate change caused the Arab Spring. But I think there's plausible evidence to say it was one of, just one of the contributing factors. And you can make the same kind of argument in Syria with the drought. And you, know, and you now look at what a you know, god-awful mess that we've got out in the Middle East. Water, you know, pay attention to water, uh, how that works so far. International treaties have been pretty good, but uh, you hear more and more people saying, you know, kind of what's mine is mine, what's yours is mine, uh, and that could be dangerous for, uh, for security. Okay, so that's like all this stuff, so what to do? And I kind of like this, this head of Janus here because it's so easy, and especially for, you know, any engineers in the crowd? Oh, there's got to be some. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm, some days I do engineering. You know, I mean, what do we do? You know, what we're going to be asked to build something. The normal thing you do is say, well, what were the conditions in the past? You add a safety factor, right? And you say, hey, let's go build it. You know, the trouble is, is nowadays, if the past is not like the future anymore, or the future is not going to be like the past, I should say, you know, that may not be the right way to go about it anymore. So what, what do we do? Okay, there is, you know, one of the things is sort of like some, some basic reading. So on the, these, the first two on the left are more on the national security side. But the one in the middle and the one on the right are really for general audiences. So the American Association of Advancement of Science came out with this thing called What We Know. I don't know if anybody's seen it or not. Uh, it's eight pages, and that includes pictures. So it's not, it's not that much. It really isn't that much. And it's good. I mean, they've, we've taken like some of the best, best people in the country and put it together. They're, they're the middle one here, this climate change evidence and causes, that was a joint publication put out by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the British Royal Society, which is their equivalent of, of our national academies. Uh, it's 36 pages. It does have pictures as well. So, like, if, you're kind of, if your appetite gets wet with the what we know, if you go on to this, you're frankly going to know more than about 90% of the people. And it's all written at, you know, basically anybody with a, uh, a good high school education, maybe a year or two of college, can, can read it. It doesn't matter what major you are. It is not written to be science geeky. In fact, they worked really hard to make sure it was not science geeky. Uh, I'm pretty sure they spell out every kind of term in there. They have, like, simple yes-no answers for what we know and stuff like that. So, you know, the knowledge is... is is a good, good start, because if you have that one, you're, you're just so far ahead of the game for everyone else. Uh, looking at this in a team, you know, I was, I was really happy to hear the mayor talk about how he's working on the, uh, on, on the White House task forces for, for the cities. Here, here's another one that's, that's again, working, working with the cities. I showed you that sea level rise thing that Norfolk has. So they got huge, you know, biggest naval base in the world is down there. Air Force has a massive base. NASA has a, a huge installation down there. I think it's six or eight local jurisdictions, state of Virginia, port authorities, all that kind of stuff. And they figured out that, you know, unless you form the right team, you're not going to figure it out. Because, like, when we started talking about this five years ago with the Navy, you know, the, the Navy's answer, you got to love the Navy. Uh, it's like, well, we'll just build a wall around the naval base and life will be good. And I says, okay, dudes, you know, that's, that's really great. Where do your sailors live? I think about this. You know, where do you get your power from? Oh, yeah. You know, where does the internet come from? Now, we're, now, now I got their attention. You know, where does the internet come from? And it's like, yeah, dudes, all of this stuff, you do not live on an island. And if you just build that wall, one, your sailors aren't going to help. And two, you're actually just putting more water into some of the places where your critical infrastructure comes from. Uh, or in the case of sewer, it goes to. 
So you need, to, you need to really think about that. So it's like, okay, let's figure out how do we do this as kind of a, 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 a whole community here. And they're, they're an example, and I'm just thrilled to hear that it sounds like Grand Rapids is, has a similar kind of uh, uh, team. The mayor knows this, and Dan and Sarah know this. Uh, leadership really does count. The only reason I did anything in the Navy is because this guy and then the Chief of Naval Operations, this guy being Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis, and the Chief of Naval Operations supported the Navy getting into this. And they continue to support the Navy even after the midterms of 2010, when it would have been politically very, very easy to say, you know, let's just not like, do this. So leadership does count. Uh, once you get the leadership, you know, the worker bees can go off and do their thing. But if the leadership isn't there, uh, it makes it a whole, whole lot harder. So I'm going to just talk for, you know, just a second, you know, kind of what can, what can one person do? This is, you know, clearly Nelson Mandela kind of looking at himself in the mirror. And this was just a, uh, just a talk I gave down at some really small library down in the boonies of, of southern Pennsylvania in a town of about 800 people really conservative part of the state, you know, the least likely I ever thought would be interested in climate, but they had some leaders in that community, and they said, why don't you come down and talk to us about this stuff? So, we all know, how do you get stuff to go viral on the internet? Cats, cute cats, right? Okay, I don't have any cute cats. The best I can do is a cute llama. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the best I can do. And, and what do I, what's my little llama thing, learn? And I talked about, like, a couple of slides ago about some of the things you can learn. Just learn the basics, that's all. We don't need to make you Michael Mann or Richard Alley or any of those guys. Just, just the very basics. And you're 90% ahead of everybody else. Uh, the second L, local action. You know, what can we do now? What can we do now on efficiencies? I just saw this morning that Penn State has signed on, actually, with uh, Michigan State. Uh, on the Department of Energy's basically uh, pledge to reduce building energy use by 20% over the next decade. So Penn State and Michigan State are number one and two on square footage. I think we have 28 million, Michigan State at 20 million. You know, between the two, almost 50 million square feet of space, we're gonna reduce our collective energy use by 20%. That's something we can do now. When I moved to State College, I picked a place I could walk to work from. I thought that was pretty cool. Now I still have a Subaru because it snows up there and I need to get to Washington DC, so I don't claim that I'm like living, you know, have a hair shirt on and living in a cave or anything like that. And no, 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 no. But what can you do? You know, we put in new insulation, we put in new windows, you know, it's stuff like we can do. Uh, so there's local action you can do, and when I say local action, it's sort of like, you know, think of that food, energy, water footprint that we have. You know, that's what I mean. I mean, it's great to take out your recycling, and I do that too, but, you know, these are, these are the parts. The M, it's a little esoteric, I admit that, but this whole idea of monitoring, just knowing, understanding the Earth, uh, it's kind of more on a science side, but it turns out that if you can't monitor the Earth, it's really hard to tell what's going on. Uh, and when you dig into how we monitor the Earth, I mean, it's, it's sort of like this haphazard, deck of cards that usually doesn't stand up very well. And the A is advocacy, you know, and, and we saw this with the uh, climate march, right, in, in New York City not too long ago. Uh, I tell people, you know, just ask your, ask your elected officials, and the mayor's probably going like, to kill me at this point, but uh, what are you doing to stabilize the climate? What are you doing? How are you adapting? How are you ultimately going to stabilize the climate? And especially at the federal level. You know, at, at the federal level, what that does, you know, I don't know what answer you'll get back. Notice it's, a, it's not a yes or no question. This is like from Dating 101, don't ask yes or no questions. So it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a what are you doing, not yes or no. And it's not do you support cap and trade, do you support carbon tax. But even if you don't get much of an answer back, you know, somewhere in the face of the brain of that elected official, it's like, hey, a voter's interested in this stuff. Maybe I should pay attention. Because if you're not interested, why should they be interested, right? Why should they be interested? So 
so the advocacy part will help. help. I've talked to a number of sitting and former congressmen, and they said, I'm not sure that we're going to leave, but we can be led. And I think ultimately it's going to be up to us to provide the leadership. Okay, so you, you've seen this sort of matrix several times now. And, you know, at the risk of really embarrassing myself, you know, is this, you know, potentially what it would look like for, uh, for Grand Rapids? You know, maybe there's, a, maybe there's an agriculture uh, column here as well. For, uh, I mean, certainly when I came in, a lot of, whole lot of agriculture I saw from the, uh, from the aircraft. You know, what does your infrastructure look like? How do we take care of the people in our community? How do we take care of our economy? I was talking to uh, Sarah at the, just before this, you know, and say for higher temperature. I mean, I, I understand that you have a lot of health care uh, capacity and, and a, lot of, a lot of health care systems in, in Grand Rapids. You know, could you be the leader for how do you take care of elderly heat stress? I don't know. Uh, who else is doing that? Who else has really owned that space? Why can't, why can't Grand Rapids and the, and the industries here own that space? Maybe that's totally the wrong thing. But in addition to thinking about, okay, how do I protect myself? But where are the opportunities? And how do I become the experts? How do I become the people who says, you know, I can deal with this. There is some adaptation uh, methodologies. I'll just build this. This can be as hard or as simple as you want, but it's, it's really pretty simple. You know, kind of understand to the degree you can the changes. There's always uncertainties. You know, understand impact, sort of, you know, probability times consequence. You can do risk assessment. It can be a butcher block table, piece of paper in the afternoon with a bunch of smart guys and gals. Or you can uh, hire one of the national labs for a couple million dollars to give you really cool looking curves whichever, uh, do something, sort of that lower left, the seven o'clock, eight o'clock position is probably the, the hardest one there, do something, and then see how it's working. That's kind of it. I mean, that's, that's a, a method. So we got that. I'm just about done. Uh, I'm gonna go back to this just one more time. This is sort of that, another way of looking at that whole change thing. So on this slide here, it comes out of this book here by Burroughs. Uh, really old is on the right and today is on the left. And all these bars here, these are not, it's not the average climate. It's how much climate changes up and down, up and down, how much it varies. And what it kind of shows me is that for tens of thousands of years, there's a whole lot of variability in the climate. And then right at about 10, 12,000 years, it's like somebody just throws the breaker and they turn it off. So even though we think, you know, climate's been changing like Little Ice Age and medieval warming period, compared to what we know it can do, it's like nothing. It's like nothing. So the question is, as we now change the climate, inadvertently but, but change nonetheless, do the, does this variability start to come back up? Because we know the Earth is more than capable of having this kind of variability. You know, we, we have the brains we got about 50,000 years ago. There's this book by uh, Nicholas Wade, Before the Dawn. It's paleogenetics, if anybody's interested in that stuff, this is a cool book. Uh, but you know, if we had the brains we had, why didn't we have these phones, you know, back 20,000 years ago? Why did we have to wait till now? Uh, I would argue in part, we as a species, were just trying to survive. And then everything kind of steadied out. So, you know, if we were not changing the climate, we'd probably have about another 20,000 years of stability before we go back into this naturally. Uh, but maybe we'll only have a couple of decades. We'll see. Okay. So I'm just going to, that's a lot of esoteric stuff. Let me just show you kind of personally what this stuff looks like. Uh, one of my jobs was in Mississippi, and I ran the Navy's uh, Weather and Ocean Command. And that was the house we lived in. And that was the house we lived in on the 29th of August, 2005. So if you ever want to know what a nine meter storm surge does, uh, and my guess is if you get a really big river flood with really high velocities, it'll do the same sort of thing. Uh, that's, that's what it does there. So 
I'm not saying that Katrina is climate per se, but I can show you what nine meter storm surges do. And we were elevated, we were above the FEMA floodplain, all that kind of stuff, you know? Didn't matter, just didn't matter. So when I look at my former town, Waveland, Mississippi, this is now my lot. Yes, there is a for sale sign. If anybody wants to live in Waveland, Mississippi, come see me, okay? The people next door to me, my next door neighbors, they said, you know, this is never gonna happen again. They rebuilt exactly at the same elevation. The plumber on the corner, he's no fool. He says, I'm not moving, but, but mama didn't raise no fool. So he's up at about 30 feet on those <laughs> pilings, the little pilings. I don't have the heart to tell them what debris moving at about six or seven knots is gonna do to those little pilings there. But, but he's really convinced. He's good to go. And then the water's right there. And you know what, 99% of the time, there's not even a foot of wind wave on that thing. It's flat. And it's just hard to imagine what it does. But it will do this. And there's this whole interesting thing. It gets into social science, why people sort of keep rebuilding here. But this is what Waveland looks like now. It's very much of a patchwork. So, you know, we're coming up in World War I and we're in the 100th anniversary. So this guy here, Clemenceau, he was the French premier, and a very famous guy in World War I. And he rather famously said that war is too important to be left to the generals. So I would say if he was around now and if he thought about this, maybe he would say something, something like this. This is a people problem. It's not just an environmental problem. Okay, so I told you I did not believe in climate change, although I am convinced by the evidence. What I do believe in, though, is I believe in this country. I believe in America. Uh, I believe that when we are focused, we figure out problems that are too tough for anybody else to figure out. When we are focused, we provide the leadership the world not only needs, but wants, and frankly expects from this country. You know, Winston Churchill is alleged to have said that Americans can be always counted upon to do the right thing after exhausting every other possibility. So maybe nationally we're still in the process of exhausting possibilities, but as you heard from the mayor, I'm seeing more and more at local levels, wherever I go, people are working on uh, on the solutions and you know we, we figured out the Apollo 13 we have we do amazing things when we get ourselves focused and we will do so here with the climate we will figure this out thanks very much ladies and gents I appreciate it